Welcome back to the One God Report podcast. This is Bill Schlegel. This episode is the last in a series of three with Dr. Dustin Smith, who led us on a study of pre-millennial or amillennial. This episode might be called A Tale of Two Cities or The One Thousand Years of Revelation Chapter 20, Literal or Symbolic. A couple of introductory comments before we get back to the interview with Dr. Smith. By listening to reactions and seeing some of the comments from the previous two episodes, it seems to me that there was some confusion over millennium versus kingdom. It seems to me that people equate the idea of the 1,000-year millennium with a literal kingdom of God on earth. In some correspondence, we had Dr. Smith wrote to a friend saying, perhaps there is some confusion. I too believe in a kingdom on the earth which will be consummated when Jesus returns to earth. In short, we may disagree on how to interpret Revelation chapter 20, but this does not mean that we do not share the hope of Christ's return to rule and reign in his literal kingdom on the earth. Unquote. So apparently, some of the predominant amillennial view hold that there is no literal rule of Jesus on earth. Well, if you've listened to the previous two podcasts, you can see that obviously neither Dr. Smith or myself believe that is the biblical presentation. We do believe that Jesus Christ will return and will rule over a literal kingdom on the earth. I think the amillennial view espoused by people like Augustine corresponding with the rule of Constantine and subsequent rulers of the Byzantine Empire, they allegorized everything concerning the literal, physical rule of Jesus the King on earth, because they thought that Constantine and subsequent rulers of the Byzantine Empire and eventually Roman popes, that was the kingdom of God on earth. There's no need for Jesus Christ to return and establish his literal rule on earth and, shall we say, displace their political system. And going along with that was this whole idea of, at death, of a disembodied escape to heaven, so that For them, the kingdom of God eventually also included some kind of a disembodied soul in heaven, which totally negates the proclamation, hope, and necessity of physical bodily resurrection. The essential story of the Bible is that a man, Jesus Christ, has been raised literally, physically from the dead, and that he will return. The scriptures say, HaShamayim Shamayim Lelohim, Va'aretz Natan Livne Adam. The heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to the sons of men. So let's get that straight, and let's not confuse the idea of a literal 1,000-year rule of Christ as sort of a preliminary stage of the kingdom of God to the kingdom of God itself. Both Dustin and I believe in a literal, physical return of Jesus Christ to rule over a literal kingdom on earth. The question is, is there a 1,000-year kind of preliminary or transitional period after he returns. Then I'll just say, too, that not so many people really dealt directly with some of the texts we looked at previously. For instance, the parables of the kingdom in Matthew chapter 13, and as well the parable of the sheep and goats, which Dr. Smith referred to, which is recorded in Matthew 25. The context there is the return of the Son of Man in his glory. This is the return of Jesus. This is not 1,000 years after Jesus Christ comes back. And in the parables of the kingdom in Matthew 13, there are aspects of those parables that are going on during the current age. The coexistence of good and evil is the most obvious. The wheat and the tares are growing together. The bad fish and the good fish are swimming in the sea, and then the net catches them in together. And we have the idea of the close of the age in these parables. Okay, Jesus is talking about the close of the current age. So to me, it's very difficult to project the parables of the kingdom in Matthew 13 to sometime 1,000 years after Jesus returns. You also have in these parables, the kingdom there in Matthew 13 and Matthew 25, this destruction or the judgment by fire, departing into fire, thrown into fire, which looks to me to parallel Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, in 2014, casting into the lake of fire. So again, these kinds of parallels seem to set 
the close of the age, the close of this current age, at the coming of Jesus and the separation of the righteous from the unrighteous and the judgment of the unrighteous at that same time. Now, Dr. Smith will start out this episode talking about the tale of two cities, Babylon and Jerusalem, and he describes how the author is writing so that the people who read the book of Revelation in the first century AD were challenged to decide which city are they in right now at the time of the reading. Yes, there would be implications for their situation as well in the future, but as he describes these two cities, they were being presented with a challenge and a decision, which one were they associating with right at the time of the writing? Just like we right now, when we read the book of Revelation, we are challenged to think, which city are we a part of? Are we part of the new Jerusalem or are we part of this Babylon who is against God and who epitomizes the wickedness of man and the corruption and the power and greed of man? Which city are we a part of now at the time that we read the book? And yes, our participation now in either one of those cities will have results for our future. And I believe the author puts the same choice before his readers with another metaphor. We could also call this episode the tale of two women. He describes, on the one hand, this harlot who is the epitome of immorality and is prospering by the oppression of others and even the blood of of the righteous. Is that what we're to be part of now? Do we want to be like this harlot? Or are we like the bride of Christ, pure, beautiful, appropriate? Now, at the time of the writing, the readers could decide which of those do they want to be associated with. And likewise, we reading today can decide at this time, right now, Are we part of the bride of Christ, which the author himself tells us is the new Jerusalem? So he makes the connection between these two metaphors. The city of Jerusalem is the bride of Christ. Are we the bride of Christ or are we like the harlot? That decision is still open for us to this very day. We associate with one or the other. And yes, our association with the bride or the harlot will affect what happens for us in the future. And this is a big point that Dr. Smith will make during this episode, is that there are aspects of the kingdom of God that have come upon the current age. He'll make a reference to Luke chapter 11, verse 20, where Jesus says, If it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. There is some aspect of the rule, the kingdom of God, that has come upon upon the people in Jesus' day. So let's get back to the discussion with Dr. Smith. A tale of two cities, the 1,000 years of Revelation 20, literal or symbolic. In chapter 17, it begins kind of this long motif, which I like to call the tale of two cities. You've got Mm -hmm. a, a terrible city, that is often described with a woman, and this woman is awful. She's literally in Greek, she's the mega whore. And compare that to this beautiful bride of Christ and this other city, which is the city of New Jerusalem. And the whole point is, you know, which of these cities would you want to be a part of? Which of these cities would you like to be a citizen of? Do you want to be a citizen of fallen Babylon, or do you want to be a citizen of of New Jerusalem? Do you want to associate yourself with this terrible, nasty woman who is riding on a beast and she's drinking out of a chalice the blood of the people of God that have been murdered? Is that the kind of woman you want to associate yourself with? Or do you want to associate yourself with uh, the bride of Christ that's beautiful and glorious and clothed in white? Now, Mm -hmm. it's interesting because the imagery of the city involves a lot of the culture that's taking place there in the first century. So an interesting passage here relating to something we've already looked at before. But in chapter 18 and verse 4, there's this voice from heaven that says to come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive of her plagues. And this is a call, summons, an invitation to come out 
of this fallen Babylon city. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, what would that mean for those persons that lived in Ephesus, Smyrna, Laodicea, Philadelphia? What does that mean? Does that mean that they need to pick up and leave and move and, and go somewhere else? Does that mean they need to move to, you know, the Holy Land? No, mm -hmm. it means that they need to distance themselves from accommodation and from things that are opposed to what God wants them to do, and they need to have sanctified lives, and they need to remain pure by obeying Jesus and doing what God asked them to do. So we have the summons there to come out of one city in chapter 18, verse 4, but I also mentioned Revelation 22, 14, where we have the invitation there to come and to enter into the gates of another city. But in order to do that, you got to wash your robes. Mm. Got to repent. But that, mm -hmm. that invitation is open to people. Even in, in verse 17 of chapter 22, we have the spirit and the bride. And we all know what the bride of Christ is, the bride of Christ of the church. They're, they're saying, come. And the one who hears, come. And the one who is thirsty, come. But the one who wishes to take the water of life without cost. No, it's just this, this invitation, like, come, please, please, like, come and associate yourself with our city. Come take from this water of life, not this nasty, terrible drink that she's having. And mm -hmm. you, to, you want to come and enter into one city, but you also want to exit out of another one in doing so. So there's definitely the sense of practical application that is taking place here. And I, At that time, at the time yeah. they're reading it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is the last chapter of the book, right? And this is where that verse comes in that I mentioned that threw me off. Right. Right. Outside right. of the dogs and the sorcerers and fornicators. It's at that time they can, he's saying, look, at, there's your choice. You want to be out there? That's where you're at. You want to be in here? There is blessing and, the, and there's going to be blessing. Yeah. So, Dustin, let me ask you then, how do you understand the 1,000 years in chapter 20? Yeah. So, like I said, when we look at the other numbers, you can look and see what sort of uh, imagery might be involved with this. And you know, if you've got other numbers that are like the common numbers in the book of Revelation, you've got four, you've got six, you've got seven, you've got three and a half, you've got 12. Those are relatively small numbers. One digit, two digit. Jumping up to a thousand is like, whoa, that's huge. That's a big deal. And so what you could do is you can look at the other places to where the number 1,000 shows up in the book of Revelation, you can see, okay, is this number being used literally? Of course, to interpret a symbol literally, I think is to forget the fact that it is a symbol. Mm -hmm. Okay, we need to ask, what does this number symbolize? And when you look at the number 1000, and also the fact that these numbers also show up in multiples, so the fact that you have 144,000, that is 12 times 12 times a thousand. So there, now you have a mixing of, of these sort of things there. But you have like multiples of a thousand at that point. I'll give you a good example of this. So in chapter seven, this is where we have the first occurrence of the 144,000. So in chapter seven, verse four, it says that I heard the number of those that were sealed. And the sealing here is not the kind of like seal that you put over leftovers to where it like keeps it and protects it. This is a seal, like a stamp. They're sealed, they're marked mm -hmm. by God and by Jesus, meaning that God owns them. Mm -hmm. So they're sealed. And what is this number? 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. So it goes on, it says Reuben, 12,000, Gad, 12,000, Judah, 12,000. Okay. So clearly there, 144,000 is just these multiples of 12. Now, here's another interesting point. In Revelation, you have to learn about the hearing and seeing motif. What is the hearing and seeing motif? The hearing and seeing motif is that at one point, John the Revelator is going to hear something. And then he turns and he sees something. And what he sees always interprets what he just heard. Okay. okay. So that's that's been used prior to chapter 7, in some very important places, especially in chapter 1, in chapter 5. I think the fact that he heard that Jesus was a lion, and when he turns and he sees Jesus, that Jesus is actually a lamb, mm. indicates that, oh, how is Jesus going to be a ferocious conqueror? He's going to be a ferocious conqueror by suffering and dying as a lamb. And that's why Jesus is referred to as a lamb 28 times in the book of Revelation, and not as frequently as a lion. I think lion is only twice. 
So we have the hearing and seeing motif. So we've got the hearing that goes on here in verse 4. He heard the number, and it's 144,000 from the Israelite people of God. And then in verse 9, it says, After these things I looked. Notice the seeing there. Mm-hmm. And does he see 144,000 from the Jewish people? It says, Behold, a great multitude which no one could count from every nation and tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white with palm branches in their hands. So when we see this number of thousands and their multiples, when it gets interpreted, it gets interpreted as this great, huge number, this great multitude that no one can count. Mm -hmm. So if the number 1,000 and its multiples gets interpreted as a great big number that no one can count, it seems very unlikely that the number 1,000 is intended to be read exactly as 1,000, as in not 999, not 1,001. It seems that it's a large number indicating something that is just very, very big. And again, when you compare it to the other numbers, obviously 1,000 is much larger than 3.5 and, and 12 and 7 and 6. Mm-hmm. That's, that's some of the evidence that I think helps to give me some direction by taking seriously how Revelation uses this imagery already. Okay. So what you're saying then in Revelation 20, when we have the thousand years, it means a long time? Yeah, I I think a a long time that is fulfilling. And so I think if we just kind of walk through some of the smaller details, it'll help us to see this. Okay. Okay. So first of all, we have in verse 2, the binding of Satan for 1,000 years. Mm -hmm. And then in verse 4, we have those who maintain the testimony of Jesus and the Word of God. They haven't compromised with worshiping the beast or his image. Okay, so these are people that are being faithful. It says that they came to life. Actually, you could also translate it as they lived, and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So there's a reigning with Christ involving a coming to life in some capacity, And that's also involved with the binding of Satan. Now, we've already seen in the Gospels that when Jesus will perform an exorcism, that he will describe this as the binding of the strong man. And he will also say in those passages, this is in Luke chapter 11 and in Matthew chapter 12, they're parallels. He will say, when I cast out demons with the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. It's an unambiguous present kingdom text. Notice there that when Satan is bound, when the strong man is bound, then the reign of God begins. Just like we see here. We see the binding of Satan and the reign of God beginning. Now, it begins with a coming to life. So the question is, is this a physical bodily resurrection? Or is this the sort of resurrection metaphor that's often used by Jesus and Paul to refer to conversion? Right, which you mentioned before, yep. Yeah, yeah. And I think of something mm-hmm. like Ephesians chapter 2, to where we were mm-hmm. dead in our trespasses of sin, and now we are alive with Christ Jesus, and we've already been seated in heavenly places. And what mm-hmm. are we sitting on? We're not sitting on folding chairs. That means we're enthroned, indicating that in some sense, through the metaphor that's going on there in Ephesians 2, that at conversion, Christians are already reigning in some capacity. So your information, what do we have? We have the people coming to life and the reigning with Christ for a thousand years. And guess what? At the beginning of verse four, what do we have? Thrones. And they sat on them. So mm-hmm. we have stuff that was already there in the teachings of Jesus and in Ephesians chapter two, reprinted right here in Revelation chapter 20. Mm-hmm. So for these people described in Revelation 20, Satan is bound in a sense. And this, yeah. is one of the, this is one of the arguments for premillennialists. And they'll say, what are you talking about? Satan being bound? Satan's not bound now, right? It hasn't been bound from the time of Jesus because there's still death, there's still wars, there's still murder, etc. But what you're saying is that for these people, there is a binding of Satan. They have been born again. Like Peter says, in, uh, he says, you have been born again of imperishable seed. We can all understand that there is a sense in which we are born now, but waiting yet for a literal rebirth, resurrection. So for these people, you're saying, 
there is a binding of Satan and a coming to life and a ruling. They're actually ruling now. Yeah, absolutely. And again, we've already seen that in Revelation 5.10. They've already been made a kingdom. Already. That's already happened. That's in the past tense. Okay, They've already been made a kingdom, but they're going to reign on the earth in the future. So again, this is something that Revelation teaches. It's something that Jesus taught quite clearly. I'm actually suggesting an interpretation here that doesn't flat out disagree with Jesus and have big holes uh, in its theology. Let's go to verse 5. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection? Yeah, so by saying this is the first resurrection, he's indicating what has just taken place in verse 4. He's not talking about that being the first resurrection when the rest of the dead come to life. That's everyone else who has not been converted. They are going to have to wait until this end time to where they're going to be raised from the dead in order to face judgment. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I think when we see here, like in verse 6, where obviously there's a, a blessing for the person who takes part in the first resurrection, because notice there, there's no power that the second death actually has. They, they, again, it's, there's a sense to where they no longer are under the power or the authority of this, this death, the death that's going to take place in the future. And notice that they are a priest of God, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. That's, again, echoing Revelation 5.10. We've already seen where they've already been made a kingdom and priest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in verse 6, blessed and holy is he who shares in the first resurrection. That is the rebirth of a human being during this age. Yes, yes. And to be clear, it is interesting there in, in verse 4 that part of what this is involves behavior that might go a little bit more than just believing the gospel, repenting, and getting baptized. It yeah. indicates mm -hmm. that these people, they have the testimony of Jesus and the word of God, and notice what they haven't done. They haven't worshipped the beast. They haven't worshipped his image. They haven't received the mark on the forehead or on their hand. Uh, so that, like, they haven't accommodated with Roman rule. Instead, they've been sealed with the mark of God. They haven't been sealed with the mark of the beast. And so this is part of the conquering that the Christians are supposed to do. And if they live faithfully and they're not accommodating with sin or with fallen Babylon or with the fallen culture, then they are invited to participate in the reign of Christ. But that's a present reality, or at least a potential present reality for the readers. Mm -hmm. Now, we do know that at the return of Jesus and at the judgment, there's going to be a resurrection of all persons. And we have, in verse 12, a time of judgment where you see the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. So there's clearly a bodily resurrection there. But notice, that's the only judgment seat that's taking place. Okay, mm -hmm. that's the only judgment that we have there. If you want to call it a second resurrection, it would be that literal bodily resurrection. Right, right. Good point. Just just like the kingdom is two-tiered, the resurrection is two-tiered to where the resurrection first is a metaphor for conversion, and second, in the future, is a physical bodily resurrection. Mm -hmm. And again, Jesus taught this, Paul taught this, Book of Relation teaches this. This really isn't that controversial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the very fact that there in verse 15, the, the very last verse, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, I've been reliably told by a premillennialist that the second resurrection is only for the wicked. But why in the world are they checking the book of life? It's the fact that if anyone's name is not found in the book of life, meaning that some people will be there. And that's because this is the judgment of all the dead, all the dead people. It doesn't just say the wicked dead. It's all the dead. Verse 12, mm -hmm. the dead, the great and the small, all of them. So you got all the books mm -hmm. there, including the book of life that's being opened. Okay, The book of life wasn't opened during the first resurrection. You don't even have the return of Jesus at the first resurrection. You have to read that into the text. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of these details are very important, and I just think this is my advice. If you're someone that has been taught the premillennialistic view, uh, you know it's, it's it's always good for us to to rethink things. For okay. sure. Let me just ask you too. So, in verse eleven of chapter twenty, would you understand the great white throne as the day of judgment for all? It's not yes. just for unbelievers. It's a day of yes. judgment for all. Yes, yes absolutely. There's, there's only one day of judgment. 
The Bible talks mm-hmm. about the day of judgment, not multiple days of judgment, not a day of judgment for the righteous and a day of judgment for the wicked separated by a thousand years. There's one day of judgment. Yeah. You know what, Dustin, as long as I got you, any comments about the Antichrist, which or who is mentioned in First John? Yeah, okay, so the first time that we see the word Antichrist showing up in any sort of Christian literature is there in First John. I think it's in chapter 2 where he says that you have heard that Antichrist is coming. But guess what? There are many Antichrists. Okay, right. but he goes on later in chapter four, verse two, and also in the other letter in Second John, chapter seven, and he defines antichrist belief and theology as denying Jesus being an authentic human being. Mm-hmm. But that's many antichrists. There's lots and lots of those sort of persons, and I think that understanding of the antichrist being something that could refer to lots and lots of persons uh, doesn't get much interest when it comes to people that are interested in eschatology. They kind of want one particular person. They tend to conflate that with the figure of the beast in the book of Revelation, but the book of Revelation actually doesn't mention the phrase antichrist. The beast from the land and the beast from the sea, those are things that would have been understood as uh, threats to the original readers. Yeah, that's good. I'm just looking at 1 John 4, 3, where he says, Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you heard is coming and now is already in the world. So there's the spirit of Antichrist was present at the time of the writing of 1 John. Hey, Dustin, thanks a lot. Appreciate it very much. Yeah, happy to be here. And uh, thanks for the opportunity. So once again, thanks to Dr. Smith for getting us thinking about these topics. I think the discussion itself has helped me understand better what is my own position and understanding of these scriptures. Recently, I was reading in the book of Ephesians and noticed how there is a striking parallel to what Paul says in Ephesians to what the Revelator says in the book of Revelation. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul says that in some way, the man Christ Jesus has been exalted above all rule and authority. Currently, that's his position at the right hand of God. Ephesians 1.20 says, which God accomplished in Christ when he raised him from the dead and made him sit at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. So here we see Jesus exalted above authorities and powers in this age and in the age to come. This relates to the question, well, how if Jesus is ruling now, how come there's still wars and death and sickness on earth and so forth? Well, for those who are willing to receive it, Jesus is king. He is the authority. For his called out community, Jesus Christ is at the right hand of God far above all rule, power, dominion, and authority in this age and in the age to come. And also then in chapter 2, Paul describes, again, the same kind of idea that I think the Revelator is presenting. He says that right now, we, the body of believers, are a temple for God. The book of Revelation describes the body of believers right now as the city in which God and the Lamb dwell. Paul describes the body of believers as the temple. He says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, that we are members of God's household built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also built into it for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So that's right now. The body of believers are a temple for God. In the same way, I think, the revelator is telling us that the body of believers are the city in which God dwells in the midst. Outside the city, it's a different story. Wickedness, jealousy, and pride, immorality are all over the place. Unholiness is rampant. But that will change. Wickedness will have its end. It may last for quite a long time, quite a while, but its end is determined. Its end is fixed. God has fixed a day on which it will end. As Paul said, 
in Acts chapter 17, 31. God has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man. Not a God-man, not a God. But he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Yishma'u the Yismachu, the humble will hear and rejoice.